thank you all very much. I was raised on the Socratic method, so I pace a lot at the dinner table, too. Um, I'd like to preface a little bit what we're going to do. I'm going to talk for about five minutes about the theoretical setup for the research. Seth, who is a doctoral student at the University of Missouri and who has done major work in analyzing the data, is going to present some of what we think are the significant findings. And then I am going to talk about what we think is meaningful about those findings as well as what we think we do not know. Um, we hope to get through all of that in 20 minutes, leaving 10 minutes for questions, comments. If you throw food, make sure it's uneaten, um, and all the rest of that sort of stuff. Um, I have to say that this research actually started about six months before Bill showed up at the University of Missouri in my ethics class, where I asked my ethics students how many of them had ever had to pee in a cup to get a job. I was completely astounded when every single one of them raised his or her hand. As it turned out, they had all worked fast food. And that was the place where I began to have the insight that this generation of students hence citizens, might think a little bit differently about privacy than my generation of students who believes in a very Dr. Strange love like way that I will not give my employer access to my precious bodily fluids. Having said all of that, we had, as academics do, some theoretical bases for this work. One is in philosophy, the second in law, and the third in a place that connects the two. Philosophers tend to think about privacy as something that enables people to become who they are. They have a positive notion about privacy. And philosophers define privacy as having control over information as well as the context in which that information is understood. Citizens need privacy as a shield against the state. Think George Orwell in 1984. Citizens also need privacy as a shield against corporate power. Jewish law has developed a tradition against what is called the harm of being seen in an open courtyard. Today's examples of Facebook, MySpace, and YouTube are a virtual kind of open courtyard that, may, that raise many of the same questions. Privacy is global. Probably the best illustration of that is Article 12 of the Declaration of Human Rights. That's the philosophy side of the street. Legally, Privacy is thought of as protection from other things. Um, in U.S. constitutional law, uh, privacy was developed literally by the experience that people had at that time, and journalists and journalism were implicated from the very beginning of the concept. There are four basic ways in which the law protects privacy. Two of them have market roots. The case law on privacy, as many of you know, varies wildly from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. The same is true internationally as well. European scholars have connected a thoroughgoing notion of privacy with the welfare state and have raised problems about that. In the US, academic scholarship tends to worry about privacy more from a technological point of view and in what is called the maximum security society. The intellectual bridge between philosophy and the law that we use is a concept called contested commodities. Contested commodities is built on what philosophers call a thick theory of the self. And what it says is that there are things that people have about them or that they own that the market can only incompletely value. So let me give you an example that is literally from the literature. It's this. About 29 years ago, my father, the lawyer to whom Bill has referred, gave my then fiancé and me $1,000 and said, have yourselves a great wedding. We said whoopee and set out to do exactly that. One of the things we did was to buy a pair of matching wedding bands. And we went to the cheapest jewelry store we could find. My husband would refer to himself as a devout tightwad. And we bought two wedding bands. All right? The market put a price on this wedding band. Not a very big price, as it turns out. But 29 years later, to at least two people, me and my spouse, this wedding band is literally priceless. It is a contested commodity. In US law, we regulate contested commodities. For example, in the United States, it's legal to sell your blood and your hair but not your internal organs. In India, it's legal to sell kidneys. 
So one of the things about contested commodities is it says that, yeah, there's maybe a price that people will accept for giving up things about themselves which are quite private, but around those things that there is a contest or a real differing point of view, that's the place where regulation steps in. Last but not least, there's the technological impact of this. And since a lot of you are familiar with that, you know, what's been written about it, I'm just going to say a couple of things. First off, there's the notion that technology has rendered privacy a vestigial concept. Um, or, said more colloquially, privacy is dead. The other part of it is, is that people have asserted, based on what evidence I'm not sure, that the more familiar you are with certain kinds of technologies, the more likely you will be to accept invasions of privacy because you know the technology and understand it. Essentially, what we did is we took all of those concepts, including the notion of peeing in a cup to get a job, we wrapped them up in a couple of questionnaires, and we got some results, and I'm going to let Seth talk about those now. Okay. Can you hear me out there? Uh, let me skip to this. So we... Uh, Commissioned this uh, national telephone survey um, of about 400 people, random sample, and um, just to get a better sense of people's general views on privacy and then some of the places where they are willing to trade personal information. Um, demographics split pretty evenly <coughs> by gender and then uh, sort of overwhelmingly white. Uh, this is our, I know you can't really see this, but this is our um, curve for our age. We grouped them uh, a little differently, though, to analyze it because we're mostly interested in these age groups. So everyone under 30s together, and then 30s, 40s, and 50s, and then 60 and over. So in the first part was just general, general thoughts on, on privacy. And um, we looked for, we wanted to find out how people feel about each of these things, but also where there were significant differences between the age groups. So these were places where there were no significant differences uh, between the different age groups. And I'll go through each of these just so you can see how they did feel. Uh, criminal background check, five is very comfortable, one is very uncomfortable. So everyone's pretty comfortable with, with doing this to get a job. Being searched at the airport, a lot of agreement, slightly less comfortable. Peeing in a cup. Sharing your medical records with insurance companies. Uh, hearing details of private lives. Recording of online purchase information. This is interesting because this is kind of low, but as soon as you say, uh, iTunes specifically, it goes up quite a bit. Um, but anyway, I pretty much ag agreement across those. Uh, this is where we did find differences uh, between the age groups. Facebook, not surprisingly, um, medical records online, <coughs> uh, taxes, employer access to email, and then access to basically any technology records that you might have. Um, so Facebook, uh, we have this uh, dip at 30, which Lee was going to talk about. Where'd you go, Lee? Do you, want to, do you want to go ahead and touch on that? Okay. She has a theory about this. Well, one of the theories that we used when we were setting this up was, is there something about as people live their lives and get experience that might inform them to make different decisions about privacy when they're 20 as opposed to when they're 60? And one of the things that I think may be going on here is that the dip at 30 and then the increasing rise is, the 30s is the generation when people start to have kids and become very conscious all of a sudden of what their kids are doing on the internet, um, how their kids can be reached through the internet, and things like that. Um, we would obviously have to do more investigation to find out if those are the reasons or if I've just made them up based on my own life experience, but we think that it's at least possible that this is the reason where there's that big dip between 20 and 30. I wanted to hear that because we're going to see that in, in a bunch of these. Um, medical records, it drops down significantly. There is a significant difference between age, the 20, the 20 age group and the 50s, um, but it's still important to note that they're, they're still both uncomfortable. It's just that the young people are slightly less uncomfortable. Uh, tax records electronically and uh, through the mail, we found some differences. Um, employer access to email. Again, that dip at 30s, but uh, the 20s group definitely more or less uncomfortable. Uh, government access to cell phone records and corporation access to cell phone records overall a lower total here um, and then the government having access to your web history access to online shopping records <coughs> same with corporations 
So on all of these, we see this significant difference between age groups. So um, the second part, we looked at um, where people might be willing to trade uh, certain things for um, for content or or uh, that kind of thing. So this is, we asked about um, sharing their phone number, Facebook, or personal information, and um, there were no differences between age groups on these to get to get news or ads to help your doctor treat you, to find out about it, about it, find out about sales at stores that you like, and in exchange for a monetary reward. So, <clears throat> and one here is uh, unlikely. Five is likely. This is very likely. So, um, ads. It's a little lower than for news. There we go. A um, little, little more likely to share personal information to get news uh, and in exchange for money to find out about sales. And then, of course, it goes way up to help your doctor treat you. That's the same. These are all the same pretty much across the board for, for the different age groups. These are where we found differences. Mainly it had to do with, with networking or uh, getting a job and connecting with classmates. This is not surprising. The young people were... Uh, more interested in sharing their Facebook page for networking, to connect with classmates, and to get a job. Okay, and then the last, the final part here is uh, just three quick questions that had to do with control and regulation. And there were n absolutely no differences uh, among age groups, which is interesting. Um, they all, everybody agreed uh, that on these three points here, and I'll show you the, the data on those. Corporations should be required to disclose collection of personal information. Um, very high. That's, this is uh, strongly agree is five. Strongly disagree is one. Uh, the, the idea that corporations will police themselves about sharing the personal information they collect about me. And then um, I should be able to control how my personal information is gathered and used by people who want to sell me things. So um, we found a couple, couple gender differences. Don't want to make too big a deal out of these, but males did seem slightly more comfortable to put information on Facebook. <laughs> females slightly more comfortable providing urine sample. Uh, females slightly more likely to trust uh, corporations to self-regulate and also to want uh, more control over how their personal data is used. And um, there, there might be some ethnicity differences. We didn't really have the data to, um, to do this, so we'd, we'd definitely like more research in that area. So um, Lee's going to wrap it up. Seth is too tall. I cannot stand behind him. Um, conclusions. Uh, one of the things that comes through overwhelmingly in this survey, in many questions in many forums, is that people absolutely do want to retain control over information use and context. It's important to everybody at all age groups. There isn't a lot of significant difference. Um, philosophers would say that that's key. That's key to becoming who you are as a person. That's key to developing a flourishing self. But it obviously has some meaningful implications for some of the use that we're talking about here. Um, we also found that older people are more consistent in their views. Seth wrote this, so he's being really kind. The other way to say that could be older people are actually in a rut, but younger people have more varied opinions. And again, um, we're not quite sure why that exists, but it seems to be the case based on this data. Corporations and government are the focus of concern. A lot of research on privacy has asked just questions about government. We thought it was really important to ask questions about corporations. As you saw, if you were able to pull up from the, from the bar charts, people are actually somewhat more concerned about corporate invasion of privacy than they are about governmental invasion of privacy, which is not to say that they're not concerned about governmental invasion. It is to say that they're more concerned about corporations, at least right now. And the areas of most intense concern focus on these things, medical records, social networking sites, cell phone records. Seth and I did this work with one of our 18-year-old freshman students. She had to explain to us why cell phone records were such a huge area of concern. We now get it. And the aggregation of personal data to be sold to third parties. Those are all areas where people think, where people are very concerned. All right. What does this mean for us? Well, one of the things it means is that if you think about privacy as a contested commodity, then the areas over which people are most concerned are also the areas where people are most likely to support some form of regulation. And you will recall that our survey, our results, 
people were very skeptical about whether or not either corporate or government would be able to self-regulate in this area. Personal experience with technology, contrary to a lot of folk wisdom out there, does not seem to influence how people respond. People can have practically zero devices, you know, a telephone, or people can have, you know, a Wii, an iPhone, a personal computer, um, a jack in the side of their neck where they get up in the morning and jack into the web. None of that appears to have an impact on how they feel when it comes to privacy issues. And we, I re did this a little bit earlier. All age groups think corporations are unlikely to police themselves. Um, obviously, that has some major impact for those of you who are thinking about venture capitalist sort of enterprises that might use some of this information. And finally, and significantly, all age groups want to control how their personal information is used. Um, they want to be able to say, yes, you may use this, no, you may not. And they want to be able to say, not just you may, but the context in which you may use it. So for example, they're worried about their medical records being put online, but they're very willing to give their doctor their phone number if it results in good medical care. So. People are doing, I think, some pretty fine-grained thinking about how their personal information by, might be used, and context is really significant. Do you have questions and or comments? My question is, uh, you didn't uh, mention identity theft, and I've come across some people who don't even want to put any of this information anywhere because of that concern. <laughs> you want to take it or you want me to? One of the things about research is that it can always get better. Um, we didn't ask people whether or not they had been the subject of identity theft. If we were going to do this again, we probably would. One of the questions that we did ask people was whether or not they had ever provided bogus information to get access to a website. And it may not surprise some of you, but about 33% of the college freshmen said that they had indeed provided bogus information to get back to the website. Older folks were much less willing to do that. Of course, the willingness to provide bogus information raises huge problems for anybody who's using that information and needs for it to be accurate in order for something else to happen. So, it, it, I mean, it could be that people at the University of Missouri are remarkably unethical, or it could be that students at the University of Missouri think that this is kind of a way to foil the system. And identity theft may be part of that, but I honestly, we didn't ask that specific question, so I can't tell you. I was interested in what you found that there was not any appreciable difference um, among people who were tech savvy and those who didn't use a lot of technology. Do you think that um, this suggests that there's something embedded in our culture that crosses those uh, tech adoption lines? And do you think that there is some kind of a culture shift that's suggested in the future? There? Okay. Nothing big. Uh, Never that's all right. Um, Pat, thanks for the great question because now I get to do the academic thing and say we need more research. Um, having said that, if I were a philosopher or a psychologist, I would say that it's not something that's embedded in our culture. It's something that's embedded in who we are as human beings. Um, in order to grow and develop, we need a certain amount of privacy. And even though we may never say it in those ways, intuitively, we kind of understand it. If I'm a social scientist, all right, then I look at this, at this data and say, huh, well, that may be the general case, but there are certainly times when I'm willing to trade off private information to get certain sorts of, of goods and services. Um, I don't think it's necessarily cultural. The only way we would really know that, however, is to go and, and give this same survey or one very similar to it in a culture, say, like Great Britain, which has a great deal more of, you know, face recognition technology and public places and, you know, and all of, and all of that, that sort of stuff. I mean, it's an, important, it's an important question, but I don't think we have any answer to it here, Pat. Jean Rosenberg, City University of New York's Berg College. Um, I was intrigued by that blip that you saw on Facebook. And one thing I wondered was if you knew what percentage of the um, survey participants who were in their 40s, 50s, 60s actually have used Facebook or are familiar with it, and how did you deal with that in the survey? Seth, you want to? There was a whole category that didn't use any social networking, and we controlled for that. So, does that get you? Does that get you enough of your answer?
random survey. I, I, I would doubt that there'd be many people in their 60s who are on Facebook, but certainly almost everyone in their 20s and you pay <coughs> many, many people in their 30s. So what I wonder is, did you just kind of exclude those from the results, or could that have, have been a factor in the blip? Because they just didn't know what was on it. They were not part of the results. Yeah, if, okay. they, if they didn't have a page, then they weren't included. Uh, can you get on that? Oh. Um, <laughs> what was the question? Did you control for Facebook if people didn't? Yeah, have if people page? if people didn't have a uh, Facebook page, they weren't part of the data results. Hi, uh, Charlie Terry. Uh, it was curious that the the uh, there wasn't much of a difference between the the older and the the younger set. Uh, did you ha ask any questions that gave you an insight into their? Uh, understanding or naivete of the types of abuse that do go on or even the fact that uh, you know the, the referring URLs can see where you came from and what you typed into Google to get there and all of that or are they just I mean if they don't if they're not aware of it they're not going to be afraid of it so I guess that's sort of the basis um, that may be one way to look at it. What we did, we didn't ask them the specific kind of URL, or URL question that you're referring to because we, was, we were quite frankly afraid that that would be too much techno babble. Um, but what we did ask them is how did they feel about personal information collected on one site being sold to another? or being given to another. And in general, people are very uncomfortable with that. So although they may not, quote, know that it's going on when presented to them in that sort of way, okay, they're not, they're uncomfortable with it. The key exception here, of course, is iTunes. And I'm, it's not clear to me how many uh, folks, well, that would include me, who use iTunes and, and the iStore are aware of the kind of information collection that iTunes is doing in the background. You know, they just like the fact that, I just like the fact that, you know, if, if I buy something by The Clash, it will recommend, you know, something else to me at, 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 some, at some later date. Um, does that does that give you a, enough of an insight into into what we did? Um, our assumption. Go ahead. There, I know there there's some uh, recent polls too that get into this. You might you might have seen these, but they talk about how uh, how they t they tell people what what behavioral targeting is and that kind of thing, and then a majority of people would definitely say they're uncomfortable with it. So there's some stuff on that already. I guess I can say in the academic note of trying not to predetermine the outcome, we tried to phrase questions in as neutral a way as we could come up with. Um, and so iTunes was practically the only one where we mentioned a specific corporate entity. And that was because we knew we were going to catch a 20-year-old. Um, did, did you address the question about the College Board, which is the biggest aggregator of privacy information, the largest seller of privacy information of your entire student database and every student database in the country. Were the kids, are the kids even aware of that? No, we didn't address it, but I take your point. Thank you. Uh, Steve Nevis, Yale Law School. Uh, were any of your participants aware of the fact that the federal government is now aggregating most of this information for homeland security purposes? <clears throat> the answer is we didn't ask that question, again, because we were trying not to tip our hands. We asked some questions about the federal government capturing, like, your movie rentals and stuff like that. And for most people in this audience who are informed, you know that that's legal, and in fact, we do it. Um, we were trying to get at sort of deeper underlying attitudes about how comfortable or uncomfortable people would be, regardless of whether they were aware that it's, that it's being done. Um, so, no, I don't have a specific response to that, but let me give you what may or may not be a good parallel. We asked people, are you comfortable with being searched before you get on an airplane? All right. Even though the majority of our folks had been searched before they've gotten on an airplane and they understand the reason for it, it's happened to them personally, you know, they're aware. They're not comfortable with it. Okay. I, the best we could say is they're neutral about it. Um, so I think that whether or not you're aware of a particular action doesn't necessarily totally travel with, oh, it's okay with me that the government does this, or I really object that the government does it. But we didn't ask, do you know that the government does X, Y, and Z, in part for length reasons, but also in part because we were trying really hard not to tip our hands and not to predetermine the outcome to questions. Let me, let me suggest, 
Oh, one more question, then we're going to move on. <laughs> Hi, this is Molly Crawford from the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, the questions all seem to go to sort of the comfort level with personal information. Was that term defined at all in the survey? That's a great question, Molly. Yes, but only towards the end. Actually, we asked the freshmen that we surveyed, how would you define privacy? And we gave them just a blank space and let them tell us what they thought. Um, we, analy we analyzed those responses thematically, and the things that come up are pretty interesting but fit with the theory. Privacy for that group of students was, it was about control, it was about context, and it was about belonging. So it's, it's, that, it's, it's both the philosophy and the law sort of put together by these, these young people who see privacy as a way of being inclusive as a, and, a, and in addition see privacy as a way of saying keep out. 